Worshipful Brother Adam Goldman is the orator for Washington, D.C.'s premier esoteric lodge, Benjamin B. French, B. French number 15. I had the pleasure of visiting this lodge uh, last April, and yes, they are an esoteric lodge. <laughs> he is also a member of Grand Lodges and or research lodges in California, Europe, and Central America. Worshipful Brother Goldman is active in several Masonic dependent bodies, including the Scottish Rites, and the Masonic Resolutions in England and America. Worshipful Brother Goldman has written articles for Masonic journals and blogs and is currently researching a new book that promises to reveal the true identity of the Grand Master Hiram Abiff uh, using linguistics, comparative mythology, and numerology. Worshipful Brother Goldman speaks several languages and is a real traveling man. In the last few years, he has journeyed extensively on behalf of his research interests, which include excursions to Haiti, Iceland, England, France, and Nicaragua. Worshipful Brother Goldman is a U.S. Army veteran and is currently working as a social scientist at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So without further ado, please help me welcome Brother Ad Worshipful Brother Adam Goldman as we set up this. Ancient mythologies will denote that with ELF or ELF, 
and, uh, and obviously we'll use the word archetype or art when we're looking at the uh, comparative mythologies and hopefully we can draw some conclusions based on that. And so to get an idea of what this would look like, um, so here's the story of the uh, Tower of Babel. And so if we're trying to think about whether the idea of King Solomon's Temple, we'll start with that one, whether that's unique to Freemasonry or if this is something that we could see elsewhere under different names, then this is a, this is a great way to, uh, to get our feet wet as a foundation. So if you look in the foreground here, the, uh, the, well, first the story of uh, the Tower of Babel, there had been a flood, and so man and his hubris had uh, decided that they didn't want to drown. Next time there's another big flood, so they're going to make this giant building, and if uh, there's another big flood, they'll be above the flood waters. So, but when you look at the uh, ancient plates that describe the Tower of Babel story, you'll see that essentially you have these three reasons in the foreground, what we would call photographs, and they're preparing stones for the builder's use. And as a matter of fact, if you look throughout, you'll see a very Masonic style story. You're going to see that they're divided into different groups, much like we divide our own into entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master masons. Uh, you imagine the master masons are probably somewhere within the building, but, um, but here we see much the same. But for tonight's lecture, it serves more than one purpose. A, it gives us the idea of what an archetype of a Solomon's Temple or a King Solomon's Temple archetype might look like. But B, um, this is great because up to this point in biblical history, there's one language spoken on the face of the earth. There's only one language. And so, um, and so the uh, Bible says that you know, uh, you know, the Elohim or God is its most commonly um, um, translated um, sees the uh, hubris of man and decides to uh, um, confound their language. And so the word uh, confound just means to confuse. And so, um, and so from one moment, everybody speaks one language. The next moment, you know, all the different languages that we now observe on the planet um, uh, come about. <clears throat> and so, uh, and to this day, that if somebody is not understandable, use the word Babel as in a babbling idiot. So we still use the word Babel to denote confusion. So if you are both a theologian and a linguist, this is a, a great way to, uh, if you can prove that this is true, um, you know, you can go a long ways towards proving that the Bible itself um, has veracity. But here we see Pritchard in 1730 saying much the same thing. Essentially, 
looking at words in Freemasonry utilizing this conflict model, it, it you know, presented some really interesting results, and so I put the, um, some of the words that we use in Freemasonry into this conflict model developed by the Soviets. And um, so but the first thing I did was started with uh, some of the stuff we used in Ritual, and eventually I, I put in the name Hiram. And by putting in the name Hiram, and then, so that was the linguistics part, then it stood out a bunch of different results that led me to believe that <clears throat> There's something to this here that the uh, words are so similar that they're, you know it's worth looking into and then um, comparing the mythologies of the Highland legend with these other mythologies. Um, it really you know became a no-brainer after that. So, so um, we go through a couple quick slides and show you exactly what the uh, model looks like and. Um, it should be fairly easy to understand. It's not a complex model, and um, and then once we do that, then we can you know start looking at the different mythologies and see if um, it makes sense to compare the story of Hiram to these other characters in history. So first, this is what the model looks like. So uh, if you if you think of this as a family tree and and. The uh, parent languages are called mothers, and the uh, and the languages that stem out from the mother are called daughters. So we have mothers and daughters, much like a family tree. And up there at the top, um, at uh, level zero, you would see a language like Latin. And Latin would break into different languages like French and Spanish and Portuguese. And so if you took just one, imagine French over at A and French might change into what they're speaking in France and what they're speaking in Belgium and what they're speaking in West Africa. And you can just keep breaking down into local dialects. So, so that's, what it, that's what it looks like um, at a very high level. But if you, if you drill down and you put languages on the family tree, this is what it looks like. <laughs> and so the important part for us to uh, view is that if you see in the bottom corner over here, you can see that you have uh, languages that are very similar and they're very close to each other on the tree. So you have in the bottom left corner, you have Hebrew, and you have Aramaic, and, uh, and you have Arabic, and, and these languages are very close to each other on the family tree, unlike, you know, at the far end of the tree, you have languages uh, such as Japanese and Korean, and you'll see that they're totally dissimilar. And so what that looks like in the real world is this. So you have these names that are biblical names, obviously, and you'll see that, for instance, Yehoshua, another way of saying Jesus out of Israel or out of the Hebrew, is pretty close to the way it might be uh, said or spelled. In, uh, in Italy and also in Greece. But you'll see the spellings of Italy and Greece, the second two are a lot closer, and you'll see that on the map, Italy and Greece are a lot closer to each other. So over space and time, the uh, words change more and more and more. And so if we think about the uh, name Hiram and we uh, look at that, then there's a lot that we can do um, looking at it. So. But you'll see that, um, for instance, the, uh, in the third line, we have uh, three different names of the Lord, and you have Jehovah spelled um, in, a, uh, in a couple different ways that are very similar to the areas uh, that it comes from. So namely, over to Italy and Greece and, and far over to Israel, and you can see the last one, Jah, they've chopped the whole end off by the, way, by the time it, it gets down to the eastern horn of Africa and Ethiopia. And so, so uh, but this is essentially what it, what it looks like. And so it, it, it's, it's the, uh, the model looks like this, and for my Kabbalists, I know we have some Kabbalists, the interesting thing is, is that you get rid of all the vowels, right? In Kabbalah, we use no vowels. It's just the 22 Hebrew letters, and then it's our five finals, four or five finals, depending on how you do it. But you get rid of all the vowels, and, um, and you can get rid of the suffix, and, uh, and you end up having a series of consonants that you look at. 
Okay, so, so here, um, Steve Pinker says that you know, the, the word isn't anything more than a symbol that we all agree means something. And the agreement is rooted in these hard consonants, and so he uses the example of a duck, um, which is it's not like a hieroglyph. It doesn't actually look like a duck or quack like a duck, but it, we agree that those sounds together um, represent a duck. And so when we put the name Hiram into this model, we see that now what we would end up with is just the consonants, the H, R, and M, right? We would get rid of, uh, we would get rid of the vowels. And also, we would also expect to see H and R because depending on where you are in the world, sometimes the suffix might change. So the, the, the hard H, the hard R, or the HRM should be the roots that we see. And so the question is, is that if we, uh, if we look into this and we look at the other characters that look very much like, um, or at least that the names fit the model, then we look at the stories, and this is one of the guys that pops out at you. And so uh, Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, which means thrice great. Um, the story of Hermes is, is very similar, but if you, if you first look to the plate on your left, you'll see that he has one hand pointed up and he has one pointed down. So um, the uh, esoteric uh, uh, people in the room will automatically realize that this is a, uh, a symbol representing as above, so below as within, so without. And this is the, uh, the hermetic axiom, as it were. And the Kabbalists might look further up and, and see uh, some uh, interesting stuff in the clouds related to uh, Ain Sof and Ain Sof Hour. And then also throughout, you'll also see you know, the Trinity everywhere. You see the Trinity represented in the arrows on the right. I mean, very interesting stuff with the, uh, with the bound sticks in there. But also, you'll see down by this short guy by uh, Hermes' left foot, you see that he uh, is holding the caduceus of Mercury. And, uh, and this is essentially the Holy Writ, and, um, and you'll see that the, uh, the Trinity uh, iconography makes its way onto the cover of the book, too. It says that it's written by the three initiates, um, so the Kabbalion. And so what makes uh, Hermes thrice great? is that he was the greatest king, the greatest philosopher, and the greatest priest. And so for, you know, if we're looking here within the lodge room, and so the obvious ones are the pillar officers, the pillars of the lodge. We have the, uh, the worshipful master, and we have uh, the uh, senior and junior warden stations that have very similar uh, descriptions in the Sonic ritual as to the function of each. Uh, Kabbalistically, we might also see the idea of the three in one, what in Christianity we call the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, what in um, the East they might call Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, and what in Kabbalah we might call uh, Keter, Hokma, and Bina. But the same idea of three out of one um, is, is uh, rooted in the top three. So certainly if if, uh, if we're looking at where the mythology seems to have some sort of alignment with Freemasonry, it's, I mean, the uh, Lodge Room, most are aware, has, or at least some are aware, has a uh, very Kabbalistic interpretation, and so we see that here. Um, and so, also, uh, we see that um, he was the father of alchemy, astrology, and theurgy, and so father in Hebrew is uh, Abba, or it can be uh, just simply A-B, uh, the first two letters of the alphabet, um, Aleph, Bet, from which we get the uh, term alphabet. So, uh, by um, at least one Masonic scholar that I'm aware of, so we call uh, Hiram Abif the widow's son, and so at least one Masonic scholar that I've come across their research says that the suffix I-F with the root A-B, or father, um, means without a father or uh, a widow's son. And certainly, so we would see alignment with, with that. So we would see that, you know, we're already saying that Hermes is thrice great, very similar to the three phases of the son of our uh, different wardens of the lodge. And, um, and again, he is a widow's son. And so if we keep looking at uh, 
Hermetic philosophy, Hermetic doctrine, and, and the Kabbalion in particular, we see that it has these seven principles. Again, the Kabbalists in the room will recognize these immediately and say that these are the same type of principles that you witness when you're looking at the balance of duality in the uh, Kabbalistic tree of life. Um, but certainly, the uh, seven principles, we also see that in the degrees of Freemasonry, especially in the fellow craft degree. And then if we look at the, uh, the ELF, we see that the Kabbal Yom, if you get rid of all the uh, vowels in there, you wind up with the consonants K, B, and L, which are the same ones that you would see in Kabbalah. So that's, uh, so, so certainly there's alignment here as well, and Taoists will see uh, the idea of yin and yang as well in here. And so when, again, when we start to uh, look at the archetypes now, so um, we've all heard the story of, or, or the saying, my body is a temple. Well, in Hermetic philosophy and in uh, Kabbalistic philosophy, it literally is the temple. And if you've seen any of the representations of King Solomon's temple, I mean, the, uh, the, the corpus is uh, uh, what we call the Sanctum Sanctorum, or the uh, Inner Sanctum, where supposedly the Ark of the Covenant was housed is the body, and you'll see that some of these rooms are uh, arms and their legs, and I mean, the, the representation of King Solomon's temple, it literally looks like a human body. And so you can see that even within the lodge room, everything is, is hermetic, if not Kabbalistic. And so first, you know, if we're saying that the master of our lodge represents King Solomon, then on the far left, here's the seal of King Solomon. Again, it's the whole idea of the hermetic axiom as above, so below. And you see, you know, this you know real Narcissus type of thing with uh, Solomon's reflection in the water. And so, uh, so you can see there that, that that a it has his reflection. B it has the hexagram, which we'll see momentarily. Um, but then again, when you look at the pillars as you enter a lodge room, you see the same idea of what they call the macro or the macro process and, and the micro or the human body um, as the uh, two globes above these um, pillars as you walk in. And so one is the uh, what they call the heavenly sphere and the other is what they call the terrestrial sphere. So you start seeing that. And just like in the... Uh, in the uh, the plate that had Hermes there that we saw at the beginning of this section, um, where the little guy at his left foot had the uh, caduceus of Mercury, um, we see that in the famous Elephas Levi uh, depiction of Baphomet with the Capricorn head on it, and it has the uh, female uh, Luna or Moon over one shoulder, and then the solar, uh, you know, uh, Illuminati or illumination above the head. But you see again. Is growing, you'll see that again. It's the Caduceus, and um, and then in Freemasonry, you see the same thing. So you see in the um, in the representation in the middle, you have the All Saint Eye or the Eye of Providence, um, looking above the the dual principles of the solar um, male principle and the lunar female principle um, above the uh, square compasses, and again. Um, and then the square encompasses, which I get into in other lectures, but those in themselves represent, you know, two obvious male and female or dual principles, where you have the compasses representing the male or the phallus, and the opposite is, uh, is the female in the square. And so, um, I know we talked about Tim Hogan earlier, I have a nice quote from him here, uh, but Tim makes a good point, is that if you think about it, in Hebrew, there's no vowels. So you have three letters, He, Resh, and Mem. Mem so if you really like the, uh, but in those three letters, you're, it's dealer's choice what vowels you put in there. So Hermi is the same spelling as Hiram anyway. So really, it's, it's more it's just looking at the different uh, mythologies and seeing how much of alignment there is, and I think in the uh, in the uh, story of Hermes Trismegistus, we see you know so much that's similar to our own Hiram and Biff, uh, and, and not even just Hiram and Biff. The more we look into the other Hirams, so in the building of King Solomon's Temple, 
There was the, uh, the great archi there, or the uh, architect in charge of the work, but also there was uh, the other Hiram, or Hiram the Tyrrhenian. And Tyre, T-Y-R, is from Norse mythology, which is associated with Mars. And, uh, and it's from work, once we get the, uh, the name Tuesday, right? So two was another way of saying it. And so we see um, Tyre and, and uh, the Tyrrhenian mysteries coming out of there, which were the Eleusinian mysteries. Um, so, so I think we see a lot in there. And as we, um, as we look at some of the other researchers, you know, we weren't the first ones to come up with the idea that the, uh, that the story of Hermes and the story of Hiram were one and the same, or at least they had the same roots. Here is uh, De Hoyas quoting Pike, or at least in, in an edited version of Symbolism of the Blue Degrees, um, saying the same thing, and then uh, Paul in 28 in his Secret Teachings book. Uh, so it's much the same. And so, um, and so if we dig into this a little bit deeper, the idea of the Hermetic teachings and Freemasonry, so if the master of the lodge is representative of Solomon, what is Solomon? So Solomon is, is well, if you look at it a couple different ways, but I think the best way would be the um, Hermetic way, which is the duality. The master represents um, a, a Kabbalistic principle, what they call the first swirling, so the first emanation of deity, which is still both male and female. And in this, uh, in this uh, Hermetic philosophy, you might think of it as Hermes and Aphrodite together. So it's before there was a split into the two sexes, and so Hermes and Aphrodite together give you Hermes Aphrodite or, or Hermaphrodite. And so, so the master of the lodge is a representation of that same duality, and so we call him Solomon because it is the phallic moon and the uh, feminine, or I'm sorry, the phallic sun and the uh, feminine moon uh, that are both in his name. And so, um, so certainly that is in alignment with the Hermetic philosophy. But not just there, I mean, you know, we revere the seven liberal arts and sciences, the trivium and the quadrivium and Freemasonry, which aligns quite nicely with the seven principles outlined in the Kabbalion. And then uh, certainly we have this idea of hermetic alchemy. Um, and so um, I'm going to borrow a book one more time from Tim Hogan. Uh, Tim has a great lecture online that he has. And so for the Freemasons in the room that have been through the first degree, listen to what it is to, uh, to create a potion, I think is the way Tim describes it in his lecture, is you start by taking an herb and you pull it out by its root. And uh, the next thing you're going to do, you're going to want to break down that herb and so you put it in a beaker and cover it with an alkali like, like alcohol. And then you put it into a sand bath so that it will start being heated evenly. I believe he says you don't want to put direct heat on these beakers. So you put it in a sand bath to diffuse the heat. And, and I think it's better if you use like a rough sand of the sea. You don't want just like this fine... <coughs> See, and then you pull it out twice in a 24-hour period, and you shake it, and you break up the herb, and this is the beginning of how you make a potion. So Freemasons probably um, hear stuff in there that sounds very similar to things that we hear in our degrees. And then, so the alchemy of the Hermetic philosophy, uh, you know, they have something quite similar to what we have in Freemasonry. We have the idea, see the rough and, and perfect ashlars in here, but we take the uh, right, we, we take these rough stones and we um, that are fairly useless to anybody making a building, and, and metaphorically, we're you know, taking off all the rough edges, which are uh, symbolic of the rough edges of our personality, and we're uh, making them so that the uh, builder can make use of these stones. And in uh, the transmutation uh, metaphor within uh, what they call um, speculative alchemy, so much like we have operative masonry and speculative masonry, they have operative alchemy and speculative alchemy. And so they're doing the same thing, instead of you know, changing this rough to perfect ashwar, they're just, they use a different uh, metaphor, and they're taking some rude metal like lead, and they're making something perfect out of it. So that's the idea of the transmutation from lead to gold. 
And uh, again, and then so, um, but just so you can see that in our uh, ELF model, that the uh, Kabbalion is, you know, lined up quite nicely with Kabbalah, which again is all throughout the larger room. And, uh, and then if you look deeper into it, you'll see that Kabbalah, although I believe it, um, the uh, conventional wisdom would say that it is a, uh, a receiving, is where the word's uh, etymology is, but you can actually look at it different ways. So if you look at the ancient demotic um, um, meanings of ka and ba, it's the soul before carnation and then after carnation. And, uh, and then at the end, of course, in uh, Hebrew and Arabic, we call uh, God, or at least the male aspect of deity, all as in Allah or as in Elohim. And so you get Kaaba and Allah. So it's the idea of the soul before and after and then mixed with deity, which if you ever look at you know, the uh, symbolism of alchemy, it's all right there. It's all the same thing. It's not just you know, mixing uh, two chemicals together to get a reaction. It's that in addition to understanding how to perform ritual. But it doesn't end there. There's, if, we, if we keep looking, um, we see that there's other guys that, that seem to fit the same story. And so um, I like this guy here. So if you look at the uh, story of Horus, um, so Horus is, is a you know, very similar story. But first, if you look at the picture, you know, look on uh, your right. So he's wearing a some type of apron. He's wearing and he's holding a deacon's rod, all very Masonic. Um, the symbolism above his head um, is uh, representative of, of the same type of uh, solar deity stuff. And then on the left, we have the all-seeing eye of Freemasonry, or the eye of Providence, but now they're calling it the eye of Ra, the eye of Horus. But it's the same type of thing. And you also see above the uh, bird's head on the left, you see, again, the Trinity. And so you see, so first you see the eye between the bird and the cobra, right? And so the cobra is a symbol of the uh, you know, third eye opening. And you'll see that on the masks, you know, these death masks of King Tut and others. Um, <clears throat> but again, you see, the whole, you see the whole same thing. You see that, you know, it's the same trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, but now we're just calling it, you know, Isis, Horus, and Set. And, um, and as we look throughout the lodge room, and we look at the story of Hiram, it's everywhere once again. And so, um, but so if we look at, you know, the story quickly, I'll give you the 100 foot level of, uh, of the story as I know it. The idea is, is that uh, Horus's father, a guy named Osiris, you know, he has a half brother named Set, you know, again, it's this duality type thing playing out. And, uh, and so uh, Set, uh, the devil, kills uh, Osiris and you know, spreads him throughout the whole of Egypt, uh, some stories say throughout the, uh, the River Nile. And so Isis, in her dismay, she goes around to find all these parts for her husband, and she finds all of them except for the phallus, and so she puts them back together with a series of Kabbalistic spells, and, and eventually puts them back together, and where the uh, penis once was, takes a reed from the River Nile and puts uh, puts that in its place, and so when they uh, copulate to create the uh, child Horus, if you ever look at these pictures, they look very much like uh, Mary and Child from Christianity, but it is, uh, it is without a penis, and so it's the first non carnal union or an immaculate conception. And so, uh, and, and so a lot of people will tell you that this is where the idea of the immaculate conception comes from, but if you look at the uh, difference between the Egyptian and the Greek mythos, you'll see that the uh, idea of Hermes and Horus, and sometimes mix in their Thoth, which is the uh, magic god of, of ancient Egypt. Um, but you'll see that, you know, same thing. So there's the uh, representing both. Um, in Pablo, we would call this Tiferet. It's the uh, idea of um, the child being born, more or less. And so, but both representing the sky, sun, and moon, and they have all these, you know, same, uh, you know, things attributed to them, writing and magic and initiations, and, and also, uh, you know, with the uh, Ptolemy Greek Harpocrates, which I just threw in there because it happens to fit the model as well, and, and uh, if we were looking at hand symbols and stuff, which we're not going to get into, you'd see that there's a lot more there as well. 
But so when we look at um, where it might be, so where we might see again the Egyptian mythology of this guy who's, uh, whose name follows this linguistics model. Um, so first we see that if he's an immaculate conception, his dad's dead, he's a widow's son. So like Hermes, here's another widow's son. I mean, how many of these guys are there? And then um, we see that they're both connected with the liberal arts and science. They both have the uh, all-seeing eye, the eye of Horus, um, the obelisk, which are a uh, representation of the phallus of Osiris, the slain Osiris, we see throughout both Freemasonry, the one we came from DC, Washington Monument um, is, a, uh, is a representation of this. And so when we even say, I won't get into all the ritual now, but if you look, think about what the exchanges between the senior warden and the, uh, the master of the lodge, you find out that the master represents a rising sun, and that's not giving away any secrets, you can look that up anywhere. Um, but what is it rising above? The horizon, right? The sun is rising above the horizon. The etymology of horizon is from the word horus. And so the uh, senior warden is a representation of our setting sun. And uh, the um, and so the setting sun, we, we even say that there's a sun set because of the devil in the Egyptian mythology is set. So you have Horus and Set represented here between the master and the scene of the warden of the lodge. And again, and so the uh, lodge, uh, and so the King Solomon's Temple is uh, located in Israel, which again, there's your trinity, Isis, Ra, or Amun, Ra, and El. Um, and so, and you would think that, you know, for, again, for my Kabbalist, the, the uh, idea of Ra would be um, down here, and then Isis and El would be the, uh, uh, similar to Pokemon being uh, And so we can also see that the um, that this uh, Solomon or the sun and the moon temple of uh, the ancient Egyptians is something very similar to what we see in the idea of King Solomon's temple and um, you know, I think conventional history would tell you that this was created by the um, Pharaoh Khufu. And, but if you ever read any of Dr. Schock's books or others, you see that the idea that, that this was created by, uh, by him is certainly debatable. And uh, Dr. Schock, the, the Harvard geologist, would also tell you if you date the Sphinx, it's a lot older than, uh, than I think the 4500 BC that. Uh, Dr. Hawass used to tell us on the History Channel. But you can see that the Freemasons, I mean, if, if any of you have ever read the book, uh, what is it, The Secrets of the Dollar Bill, uh, you know, uh, book, I think that was Opus or he did the secret of the nation's capital. But if you ever look at the uh, obsession we have with not only Obelisk, but also with the pyramid, um, and, and the story that went behind how this uh, wound up on the dollar bill, all very interesting. And the numbers that are, you know, if you count all the stones and, and what the Roman numerals are actually trying to describe, and again, at the top, you have the Eye of Providence, but a Kabbalist would say, you know, this is your Holy Trinity once again. So it's all in there. And if you follow the, uh, if you follow around the uh, uh, different sides of the uh, pyramid and you put a hexagram around it, which you can find online, that it points to the letters M-A-S-O-N. So we get the idea that the Masons were behind that. All right. So that's possible. But again, Manly Hall is telling us that, you know, we're not the first ones to, to imagine that um, the uh, Masonic story that we hear about Hiram, and he spells it CH, which is, which is also interesting if you're in the Gematria, but the, um, that the story of Hiram is based on the Egyptian rites. Osiris. And so, uh, but you know, where else might we see it? And I think I already told you that the um, that the phallus of um, of Osiris can be found, you know, everywhere. I mean, you, if you ever walk through Europe, you can't go anywhere without seeing an obelisk. You got to, you know, you're walking down the Champs Elysees, or you're, you know, walking through Italy. Everywhere you are, there's just obelisks everywhere, and they all have really interesting. Uh, numbers associated with them. Uh, the Washington Monument itself is 555 feet.
tall and that's just above ground and, and the, the numerology for uh, for uh, a cosmos is also very telling but it's not just there I mean you see the idea throughout and so so again you get this idea of the uh, falses and sexual references throughout the degrees and I go into this in a different lecture but um, but literally you know you have birds and bees up in the top two corners and so, uh, and, and we're told within masonry that these symbols or these landmarks have alternate meanings. But um, but when you take it, you know, as a whole, and you see phalluses everywhere, and then um, you know, probably the root of the all seeing eye and the triangle is, is this symbol that we see in Scottish Rite Freemasonry, and certainly this one over here. You can't get much more phallus than that. But then, so we ask ourselves, so so why? Why do we have this phallus throughout the degrees if we do? And why is it throughout the whole of the uh, mysteries? It's certainly not unique to Freemasonry. If this is indeed what it is, then the, uh, then the phallus is, can be seen everywhere. And so um, if we're honest and we, we look at these things, you know, this is what we come up with, I think. So, so now we look at apron as an archetype. So where did they even come from? And uh, and so, so one of the things that's very interesting is, is if you speak to theologians and biblical scholars, you find out that the uh, Bible, much like Shakespeare, Shakespeare hit all sorts of dirty stuff in his plays, right? And he had it in, in different ways that he could, you know, uh, you know, the uh, poor people could, you know, take it all as a very dirty way. I'll get into the way he did it, but, but certainly, and then the uh, upper crust, you know, they would all have a nice chuckle. Um, so, in, so if you speak to uh, theologians, they'll tell you that you know, if people are washing feet, not so gentle euphemism for sex. But another way that that they did it um, would be through the discussion of to know. So when uh, I think it was the archangel Gabriel comes to uh, Mary and says, you know, you're going to have this uh, kid. He's going to be the Messiah. And she says, how's that going to happen? I have not yet known a man. And so, so. You, and, and we see that throughout the Bible, actually, that you use the verb to know in place of, you know, the words for sex. And so, um, and so now when we think back to this, um, the story of, of the Garden of Eden, we're thinking back and we see that there was three trees, two main ones, uh, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And, you know, Elohim says to Adam, you know, that tree of life thing, help yourself, have as much as you want, which is a representation we know of the Kabbalistic tree of life. And he's basically saying, you want to, you know, self-initiate, you want to learn all the mysteries of the universe, the out above, so below stuff, help yourself. Uh, the one thing you can't do is eat from that other tree, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so if we know that the, that the word knowledge is a euphemism for sex in the Bible, so when we're saying the tree of knowledge, what we're saying is, is God's forbidding them from having anything to do with something related to sex. And so, uh, and so the serpent on the tree, which is a representation of kundalini energy, right? And, uh, and so Tempsi even says, uh, you know, you should try this fruit, and, uh, or you should just touch it, I think is what it says. And she says, well, I'm not allowed to touch it. And he says, oh, no, no, God didn't say you can't touch it. He says you can't eat it. And so, um, so a lot of, uh, if anybody is into uh, some of the Gnostic ideologies, and I saw that in your book case out front, you have uh, some books on, on Gnosticism, you'll see that this is part of that um, stream of thought, that the idea of the fall of man was, um, was related to the idea that they had, uh, that they did something sexually they weren't supposed to in the Garden of Eden, and the Gnostics would tell you it was an orgasm. They weren't supposed to have that. And, uh, and when they did, that is what began the, uh, the fall of man. And so this is why, you know, if you look history, uh, in the history and you look at, you know, the oracles and, and the sages, that's the one thing they couldn't do, right? They were virginal their entire lives. And so, um, but so when we look at this, you know, and, and so further we think about this story and the very first thing that they do when they, uh, you know, when they've eaten of that fruit, that, that, that fruit, they realize their nakedness is they take these leaves and they sew them together and, and 
cover their genitalia is because they recognize that they're naked, which they didn't know before, and I'd argue that that's an archetype for the Masonic apron. Yeah, Fortune's book is a great one. Um, but I was rereading a part of it the other day and I came across that quote. Uh, the moon center is, uh, for the Kabbalists, is, is uh, the uh, energy at the uh, chakra of the groin, the sexual energy um, called Yasad, and uh, that's the moon center. So she's saying the same thing here. And, um, and then, so if we follow that line of reasoning, so who's the next archetype that we come across is this guy, it's called a Herma. And these are uh, the statuary that were, that they were most prominent in Athens, uh, but also through the whole of Greece and through um, the Roman Empire later. And as you went into um, a city, you would find them at the crossroads. And, and although I'd love to get into this because this gets into the idea of the transmutation and the sexual alchemy, um, I'd have to come back for that one because um, because that's where we're ready today. And, uh, but, but I think that just based on what it is we see in the different mythologies and the linguistics, there's certainly a lot there to say that Hiram is most likely an archetype. It's not an actual uh, biblical personage or a biblical personality, and so is uh, King Solomon's temple, and that the real secrets of the Masonic ritual are Kabbalistic and they're hermetic, and uh, far older than Freemasonry, and we've just uh, borrowed them and put a new spin on them, but they're far more ancient than, um, than our craft. So with that, um, I'll open up to any questions or comments, concerns. Yeah. You stumped them. Yeah, I guess so. No questions? <laughs> Justin? Yeah, I'll say hello. Um, that was very thorough. It was very impressive. Thank you. I'm curious, what other background you have besides the mainstream that you kind of drew from? So I see some of the references there. I'm just yeah. kind of curious what other things you might have read, you know, as well. That, what, what, you, you used a lot of great connections that are linked a lot of the story together. Sure. I'm curious what other kind of material you've been reading. Oh yeah, um, every, are you kidding? Everything. So uh, my background is, is politics and democracy. So so a lot of this is actually just from you know watching what's going on worldwide and knowing what a lot of the um, you know what some folks in leadership positions um, believe themselves. But I mean, this is everything from the linguistics, but also. It's, you know, a lot of, I, I saw uh, one of our brothers is going to do something about some conspiracies. If you play in that world for more than a day, you'll see that there is a nexus between uh, conspiracies, between language. Um, I mean, there's great stuff if you, uh, but, but certainly the more you follow the Eastern religions and Kabbalah, and the more you just come into the lodge room and practice the ritual, and if you liaise, if you go hang out with these other societies that were allowed to, at least, you know, as a Masonic Rosicrucian in England, you know, they allow us to travel quite extensively. I know the Grand Lodge of California had certain rules against um, other Rosicrucian bodies, but not all the Grand Lodges did that. But the, um, but yeah, so I think that when you start seeing the other uh, bodies out there, you'll see that the, you know, you know, penalties and things like that, they're consistent across all societies because they always have something associated with air and fire and water and, you know, so, so you know, where you might represent those, you know, in, in ritual, you'll see that, you know, there's ways to put spins on it, but earth, water, air, fire, those things are constant. Um, and the astrology and alchemy, you find it's the same stuff, only, uh, but they put a slight spin on it. And I always, you know, go back to the idea that when, um, you know, when I was young, there was a show on called The Flintstones. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it's this, you know, fat dad and, you know, dumb neighbor, and, you know, and, and, but I never knew that there was another show that it was based on called The Honeymooners. And, uh, but they updated the show, and then later on they redid it and recalled it The Family Guy. So, so when you look at these uh, people like, you know, uh, what movie, these uh, zeitgeist guys that completely missed the mark. They have no idea what they're talking about. And they see that there's a similarity 
between Dionysus and Mithras and Krishna. And so, so they say because of that, none of it's true, but it's exactly the opposite. It's why do they keep keeping these core elements of all the different mythologies? They rebrand them. Yes, you know, there is Mary is Mari, and it's related to uh, the ocean and the age of Pisces. But the question is, is, why do they keep these same central elements and then rebrand them every, you know, 2,160 years? And so now we are at the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and I imagine we're, we're going to see something, a, a, a rebranding, which I think we're, we're all seeing right now, we're witnessing all around us. And, and so uh, I think right now we'll see a huge shift um, to, uh, you know, the air side of Aquarius right now instead of from the uh, water side of Pisces. So what inspired this lecture? What, what were you reading or what did you hear that was a lightning in your head that said, oh, this would be something to discuss or research because this is what you're writing a book on, right? Yeah, so, so this is part of it. So, so um, I think initially I was, uh, again, I was at a think tank and I was in conflict analysis. And so I was doing a lot of, uh, you know, this type of stuff for, uh, you know, for that job and said, God, it would be cool. I, you know, I was a, I don't know if I was a deacon or something at the time, and I said, you know, how cool would it be to just put these names in and see what comes out of it? And I wasn't expecting a heck of a lot to come out of it, to be honest with you. But then as I, uh, as I started looking into the consonants, H, R, and M, and everything just kept coming out. And then, um, and then so I kept teasing on that and kept tugging at the string. And so as a good social scientist, I don't want to prove it, I want to disprove it, right? And so I said, you know, this is all a coincidence. And so I try and disprove the hypotheses, but the more you look at it, I mean, the more you find that the Gnostics, you know, like the, you know, if you've ever looked at uh, what, uh, you know, we got out of the, the great cache of the Nagamani library, right? And so, I mean, if you look at, you know, secret books of John and Epistle Sophia, this is all, this is all, uh, you know, this is what was so threatening to the uh, papacy so long ago that it led to the, Albigensian Crusades and the you know wipeout of uh, of the uh, Cathar in southern France. Um, yeah, so I mean, and, and I know a lot of us Masons love the whole idea of you know what the heck happened at the Chateau and and uh, yeah, and that's all hidden throughout. I mean, and that's hidden throughout the Da Vinci Code movie, right? So the grandfather's name was Saunier, which was you know the uh, the vicar at that abbey down there in, in Rennes. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, that whole movie is Gnostic, so uh, from what I understand, sure. So in DC, is there a lot of like growing esoteric movements within mainstream? Like, we tend to think, a lot of us in California, we tend to think we're on the forefront in the United States as far as like esoteric mainstream, but are you seeing this on the East Coast a lot right now? Is there a new push of the younger generation coming in yeah. and wanting to understand the esoteric history of it? I think so. I mean, I hope so. I should say that. Um, I think that, that there is a push that I think that the, um, that it's split. I think that you have some of the, uh, the youngsters that come in and, and they, uh, you know, they're joining for, for, you know, because they've read some of these books or they've watched these movies. And so they want to know what, uh, you know, all the symbols mean. But, but when you're in DC, it's something quite special because in Freemasonry, we, you know, we like something called hidden in plain sight, right? So, you know, we put our symbols everywhere, and most people have no idea, you know, what a point within a circle is. It's so innocuous. You drive by Target, you're like, oh, a point within a circle. I know, you know, you walk, drive by a gas station, oh, there's a Chevron, you know, there is an Exxon. You know, these are all Masonic symbols hidden everywhere, or at least we use them as well. Um, but DC is, is special that, I mean, when you walk down the street or you walk down the uh, National Mall, I mean, because across from the, uh, you know, the phallic, you know, symbol of Osiris at the other end of that mall is the, uh, is the Capitol building, right, which is the womb of the mother. And so you have them, you know, in constant duality all the time in, in the, uh, but the, the symbology around there is just everywhere. You look at the top of the Capitol and you see the goddess Columbia, uh, which is why we're called the you know, District of Columbia. And so, um, and certainly the Freemasons, uh, George Washington, and Pierre Childs, and Lafon put them there on purpose. And, and in my other lecture, if I'm ever invited back, um, I get into the uh, idea of who was this goddess Columbia? Where do we find her throughout Freemasonry? Where is she hidden in the Bible? 
Where's, I mean, and it's everywhere. The goddess Columbia, we're obsessed. And so, um, but she's also in the, uh, you know, in the water right there in New York uh, is the Statue of Liberty given by the Freemasons of Paris to, uh, to the Americans. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Yeah. Uh, thanks, great lecture, really enjoyed it. I, it's not so much of a question, but just a note on the use of aprons in Egypt. They were uh, sort of a prestige clothing item that were used by the scribes. And so a lot of the times when we see them, the gods are dressed in them as well. It's because the scribe could wear a, a, a pleated garment that, that wasn't going to be sullied by and wrinkled by by manual work. So this was like a like a suit equivalent and when they would sit down the they were designed so that you sit cross legged and your apron form sort of a, a little writing area for for their scribe. So I don't know, I just thought it was a little fun aside that you might not have. No, it's good. And, and but I would just say um, the the exoteric or the outer garments story, I always say take that with a grain of salt because um, as you come into Freemasonry, you're told that the G means one thing, and then as you keep learning, you find out that it even means something else. And, and if you listen to uh, some of the, uh, you know, the great writings of, of others, you find out that indeed it has these deeper meanings. So, so while it could mean that, and, and while you know the apron can mean exactly what they tell us, um, I had a past master of a California lodge said you always knew you were about to get a BS story if it starts off with two guys are fishing or if it starts off with Masonic tradition informs us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking back to all the times we say that. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? That's it. All right. Well let's go upstairs for dinner. Thank you so much. Thank you.